Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, a lot of people have asked, can I put, oh my God, I feel myself sweating right now. This is what I do for you. Can you put this on your resume? If you're really good at tweaking things to put them on your resume, by all means, I absolutely encourage you to do so. I do not offer a certificate for this, except if you want me to make you one MS Paint, I will do that for you and you can put it anywhere you want, including your fridge or like in someone else's I don't know. I don't care. Like, if you want me to give you some kind of like official recommendation that I've taught you this course, I can do that. Um, this was a course while I was still a student, which I'm no longer rip, um, through Oberlin College's Experimental College, which is a student run college um, program, basically, where you can teach a class on anything that you want as long as you have good curriculum for it. So, you can say that you took a class through Oberlin College, technically speaking. Wing that however you want to, out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> Go nuts. Um, formality wise, obviously this is something that I'm doing for fun, which is, I don't know if that's ridiculous, but it is what I'm doing for fun. Um, I'm going to show up to this class, possibly drinking a white claw at some point in my PJs. I have no idea. You can show up however you want. This is informal. All of drug education right now is mostly informal if it's done properly, because that's how it has to be right now. Um, like I said, this is the pinnacle of peer education. I take everything that I say very seriously on the subject. So. While this might be an informal setting, I'm like, foul language advisory, like this is a PG-13 slash R course because of the content inherently. Just going to go ahead and put a big fat content warning on everything that we go over here. There will be mentions of sex and drugs and suicide and mental illness. There'll be mentions of racism, um, police brutality, incarceration, all kinds of stuff. There will be gore. There will be like visuals of cartel violence like the works. And honestly, I can't really put a content warning on every lecture because there's just so much that you have to see. Like drugs are a can of worms in terms of not necessarily the drugs themselves, but the impact that social legislature around drugs has led to. Um, if you miss a class and I somehow manage to become technologically literate as a computer scientist, I will upload recordings of these lectures to a Google Drive folder or some kind of comparable, easily accessible online thing. Um, also, due to a very kind recommendation from someone who's in here right now, um, I've decided to open this class to donations if so desired, because obviously it's not a short time commitment. And since I do work in the event and nightlife industry, um, my income has been cut because of COVID. Um, any income that I generate from this class will be split 50-50 with the Kosekja. I don't know how to pronounce that properly, so I'm not going to butcher it but an undocumented workers fund. And so far the class has not even started and we've raised 85 bucks. So that's really sweet. Um, I'm very touched by everyone that's contributed so far. And my Venmo is on here if you desire to do this, if you love this class, but it will always be free until the end of time. So don't ever feel pressured to, okay? Um, I want people to ask questions here whenever you want to. In order to not make this a huge hot mess, I would advise two courses of action. Um, the second of which works on Zoom, but not on Jitsi. So maybe we'll transfer to Zoom next to Montalia's account. That would be great. Um, and then we can do the chat messaging thing so I can actually see what you're saying during the lecture. Um, if you have a question, a comment, or a concern, just unmute yourself and say question, comment, or concern. And then I will stop what I'm doing. I will, or I'll be like, just hang on a second. And then I'll ask you to go ahead with your question, comment, or concern. Um, please raise concerns. If you think that something that I'm, I'm saying or doing is incorrect or inappropriate, say so. This is an evolving field. This is, like I said twice already, pure education, right? The whole point of this, right? There's a whole point of drug education is to make people's use patterns um, safer and to reduce casualties. That's the idea here. The idea here is not for me to be right. So if you think that something that I'm saying is incorrect, say so. And I'm more than happy to open discussion about it. This needs to be a community effort because that's how information is spread. So the other thing is start a discussion. Um, if you have something to say that you want to, please feel free to raise your hand, whatever the fuck that means in the software. I'm honestly not sure. Um, with Zoom, maybe it'll work. I don't know how to work here with me sharing my screen. But I can't always promise that we'll have time to launch fully into a discussion during this, but I would really like to hear what you guys have to say and feel free to email me a question about it and we can talk about it later. Also, if that sound of the chat gets really, really irritating, then I'll look into seeing if there's a way for me to mute it. So just keep it listening. Last opening notes. Um, everything that you learn here, treat it as fallible, okay? This field is based on the understanding that our knowledge of this subject changes on a daily basis. So what I teach you about drugs could be subject to change within hours or days or months. Remember this fact. 
and remember the limitations of what I can teach you. I work in this industry. I do. I spend a lot of time researching and talking about drugs. Jesus, a lot of time talking about drugs. So much time, in fact, that it became a Jenga rule or sorry, a Drango rule that if you mention drugs, you have to drink because I was just that bad about it. We're just playing Drango, right? It's terrible. Um, and also remember that when you're relaying information to others, a huge component of effective harm reduction is leaving room for what you don't know and leaving room to be wrong. So if you're talking to someone about drugs and you're feeling really good about what you've learned in drugs go and you're like, oh shit, I'm gonna tell this guy like, you cannot roll more than once every three months or you're going to be at risk of neurotoxicity or something like that. Remember to be loose in your language and allow room for new information to come into your life, right? Like we do not want to have defensive conversations about drugs. Um, and also if you're meeting with people or interacting with people in the future that are not employing safe drug practices or you learn things in this course and you're like, oh shit, like that person should not be doing that. Remember that good drug education is not accessible to most people. Do not shame others for what they don't know because ultimately if there is one yeah. thing that I want you to take away from me trying to untangle this beautiful mess of drug harm reduction and history with you, it's that this is a systemic failing. The fact that we need to do this right now is a systemic failing. And if that's the only thing that you take apart from this course, then I'm satisfied. Don't forget why we're here. Um, please don't share anecdotes about your own drug use in class. We want a level playing field, right? We don't want people being like, well, one time I did eight grams of mushrooms and I met God and she told me I was beautiful. Like, that's great. I'm really happy for you, truthfully. And I'd love to talk about that with you sometime. Just call me, I'll talk for hours. Um, speaking of which, feel free to email me if you want my phone number for drug-related crises or help figuring out testing results or any questions about drugs. I'm always available to help. Um, don't ask me where to buy drugs. That's whack. Don't put me in that position. I'll tell you to fuck off. Don't do it. Thanks. That's just ahead of time. And again, in case you aren't familiar with this website that I know it says drugsexgo.weebly.com that was pointed out to me. I can do nothing about it. I'm married to this now. Everything that you could possibly need is on this website. Feel free to check out the syllabus if you want a general outline of how the class is going to go. The resources page has so much stuff on it. I'm constantly adding to it. And if you have things that you want to recommend to add to that, just let me know as well. Um, the other thing is the feedback form. And this is especially important for a class of this size. If you feel as though there's something that I'm, this is anonymous. If you feel that there's something that I'm doing or conveying that is not appropriate, especially pertaining to issues of privilege and race in this class, please feel free to submit a feedback form and let me know. I will gladly change the way they behave and convey information based on this feedback. So please don't be afraid to tell me that I'm fucking something up because I would be more than happy to open discussion. Um, all of the lecture slides are posted in advance. You can go back and look at them. I'm currently in the process of going through and adding descriptions and citations to them because let's be honest, this was a little bit of a scrappy effort initially. This is the fifth time I've taught this course and it just takes a lot of time to go back in and fix everything up. So be aware that by the time I teach a course or a class every week, I will have gone through and cleaned it up. But if you're looking in the future, then the citations and the notes might not be pristine. And there might be language that I go back in and change later because again, ever evolving field, every time I teach this class, things have to change. With this being said, let's go. Any questions, comments, concerns so far? Hey, so I don't know if you can hear me. So. We are having issues. We've been talking in the chat with the text in the PowerPoint, so it's like blurry-ish. Okay. Tight. Um, Talia, are you willing to use your Zoom instead? Give me, give me one second. Okay, because. Yeah, give me like literally a minute. Damn. I've had the experience in Jitsi when the additional cameras are off, then it can load the speaker and your screen faster and more efficiently. Okay. So that might be another solution. Do we want to try everyone turning their video off? Oh, I'm gonna make uh, have you tried using your Zoom since um you left? You can certainly try it, um, but it did tell me last time that I only have the free account now. How's this looking to everyone right now? It actually does look clearer right now. Way so, better, yeah. Can you guys read everything? Yeah, it looks clear for me too. Yeah. How yeah. about this? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's yeah it's good. All right, we got some tech lords in this bitch. Let's do it. Okay, so for the purpose of 
this class. And if anyone, in I the just, future, yes, go ahead. I just sent uh, the oh, Zoom link in the chat. What are general thoughts and feelings? We want to switch over to Zoom, or is it looking good now? I mean, it's looking good now, but if we want to switch, not opposed. I can do either. Thoughts, feelings? I think it's looking good, and we should roll with it. I think if it goes down again, it might be worth switching over, but right now what? it might be okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I support the staying until there's a problem. Let's stay. Okay, no hopping ship. Let's do it. <laughs> Drugs go continues. And again, in the future, if there's ever an issue like that, just unmute yourself and say concern, or you could just talk, honestly. Maybe it would be kind of weird if you're just like, concern. Okay, let's start. <laughs> so, for the purposes of it's this- It's up to point, you. The, Rachel, the room is open. Okay, um, if it ends up getting botched, then we'll hop ship and it'll be so much fun. Okay? Cool, let's do it. So, for the purposes of this course, um, I don't know about you guys, but it always really bothered me when we would do like one day that was all introductions and like reading the syllabus in class. And for those of you that have not been in a class for a billion years, I hope this puts you in a nice state of euphoria, feeling like the ad drop period has started and there's like a window in which you have to decide if you want to stick with me. So, a drug is, for our purposes, a medicine or other substance which has a physiological effect when ingested or otherwise introduced into the body. I have the Zoom link already yeah I know but we're gonna stick here for now because it started working better okay so this is the definition of drug that we're using right now okay and the reason that I want to make this very apparent is because more often than not you hear people being like coffee's not a drug that one really gets me. Weed's not a drug. That one really gets me. I just say weed isn't a drug. I won't be an asshole about it. So let's go back to kind of the beginning-ish of the, the nitty gritty. And I assure you, for those of you that already feel like you know a lot about drugs, we will go very deep into things. Very, very deep into things. Into the nooks and crannies and the little like street vernacular and stuff like that. But for now, I want to get the basics out of the way. So the next couple of classes, we're just going to get like the major shit off the table. So 1971, Controlled Substances Act, also known as CSA, was introduced by everyone's favorite president in history, Richard Nixon. And this was the act where in the United States, prior to this, we did not have the schedules of drugs that we know and love today. So this was the act that introduced this entire process of becoming more stringent, not only about how we produce drugs, but how we interact with the manufacturing and the use of them as well. So within the Controlled Substances Act, this whole thing was kind of based around this concept of a drug's potential for abuse. Now, the problem with this is that the word abuse is not actually defined within legislative context, right? So anyone that goes in and looks at the Controlled Substances Act can basically evaluate it and say, okay, look, like, I think that this drug classifies itself as a drug of abuse because X, Y, and Z reasons, but there's no actual standard protocol for how to decide that. And this leaves the door way open for unfair or politically biased scheduling. At the same time of doing this, the Controlled Substances Act was put in place because we wanted to figure out which drugs could be used for medical purposes and also which drugs could be both imported and exported out of the United States, including precursors to those drugs, and decide what things are controlled. And that's what we know of today is controlled substances. So a controlled substance is something that is controlled by the government, obviously. Um, its use and manufacture are regulated by the government. So here is a kind of poorly put together, not my thing, it's by Wolf Law Colorado LLC. And they put together this drug schedule classifications pyramid, which I did not feel like doing in Canva. And this is kind of like a breakdown of the different schedules. So currently, schedule one drugs are high potential for abuse, or they're claimed to be high potential for abuse, and no currently accepted medical value. Schedule two drugs are some currently accepted medical value and a high potential for abuse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down the pyramid. So in schedule one, you have drugs like heroin, LSD, cannabis, or marijuana. There's a little bit of controversy about which of those words is the more appropriate to use, and we'll come back to why that is. Um, peyote, methoclone, and ecstasy, which I think it's really funny that they put like the entire word for ecstasy there. Uh, methylene dioxymethamphetamine took me like four years to remember that one and then in schedule two we have things like um, methamphetamine and amphetamine as well as other comparable drugs like cocaine now in looking at the scheduling pyramid you might find it immediately noticeable that there are some discrepancies here like the fact that weed is a schedule one drug 
and it's not listed here, but like meth and coke are schedule two drugs, which means that they're actually less regulated in some respects than weed is. And this kind of immediately brings up this question mark of how exactly this pyramid is being created in the first place. So the less regulated a substance is or the lower down it is on the scheduling pyramid, the less regulated it's going to be in terms of its production and its use. So again, a controlled substance, its use and production is controlled by the government. An unscheduled substance means that there are not federal regulations on use. So if we're looking at this in the context of a drug that has a high potential for abuse, with the word abuse being an operative term here, and no currently accepted medical value, you have to really wonder, right, why substances like alcohol and nicotine, and this, or tobacco, whichever, and you might be looking at this and being like, okay, basic, like, yes, I know this, this is a classic thing that a lot of people think about, but we're going to really dig into this at some point in a couple of weeks about why exactly, because there's a, a specific reason why these two substances are not regulated in the same way that other drugs are. And you have to look at something like the mortality rate from alcohol, both in the context of like withdrawals and fun fact, withdrawals from alcohol and benzos are two of the only kinds of substances whose withdrawals can kill you. Not heroin. It's extremely unlikely to die from heroin withdrawals. It can happen, you know, but like it's very unlikely. But alcohol, right? It's interesting. And also the number of overdoses on alcohol, which yes, alcohol overdose is absolutely a real thing, that lead to mortality. And yet we have these two drugs that are entirely unregulated by the DEA, except for some minor things of kind of administrative oversight. Now, another thing to get out of the way real quick, just some definitions. The word narcotic. I'm sure that many of you have heard the word narcotic used on cops. <clears throat> Don't watch cops. <clears throat> Bad TV. <clears throat> But a narcotic is traditionally known as a, a psychoactive compound that puts you to sleep. And that was what it was originally used for. And then it started getting used more in the legal context of a non-medical drug with a psychoactive effect. It does something to you on more than just a physical level, on a more psychological level, um, and known as a controlled substance. So you get the cop on the radio who's like, hey, Billy, you got those narcotics down in the storage bay or whatever cops say on the radios. Not a cop or the medical use, which is a pain relieving drug. So an opioid, typically speaking, a pain relieving drug. So it gets confusing, right? Because you see all these headlines using the word narcotic. And I would actually argue that the word narcotic, when it's not being used in an explicitly medical context, is usually an immediate indicator that whatever website you're looking at or cited source you're looking at is actually probably very biased. So look out for the word narcotic because usually you'll find an article Whenever you type in anything about any drug, you know, you'll, you'll get like 50 search results for addiction, rehab, and recovery centers. And those are not the sources that you want to be using to look at factual information about drugs, because obviously it's an immediate bias. But you'll see these paragraphs about dangerous narcotics, and they'll be like, ketamine, GHB, and LSD are all dangerous narcotics that could kill you. And it's just the, the worst, like, the, how do you just get so lazy about classifying drugs, you know? Like, just call them what they are. Like, call them their individual names. They're all very different. So the word narcotic is really reductive. I hope this chart scares you. Just kidding. I hope that you have a lovely day. But this chart, I hope, exemplifies to you just how many different kinds of drugs there are and how distinct they are, but how they share properties with each other. And that's the point of categorizing and classifying drugs. And this is a major thing that we're going to look at today and in the next few weeks is how you classify and categorize different drugs. So for instance, over here, you have this whole realm of, and this is not a perfect chart. I want to make that very clear. This chart should not be taken as gospel. It was as have many nice visuals about drugs been put together by just someone that wanted to do it. So there are imperfections on this. The only reason that I want you to look at it is for the general sake of being able to, like, someone yell out a drug, any drug, go for it. There are like 800 of you in there. Someone yell out a drug. MDMA. Thank you. Okay, so let's find MDMA in here. Let's think about what MDMA does. So MDMA has mildly hallucinogenic effects, but also is primarily a stimulant. So if we're looking in here for it, there we go. We see MDMA right there in the intersection between hallucinogens, but also, oh my god, I don't know how to pronounce that, sympathomimetic amines and stimulants as well as being contained within the psychedelic realm. So that's just one of many examples of how a specific individual single drug can have properties of many different kinds of substances. And the reason that this is important is that if you are doing research on a drug and it says 
This is a dissociative tranquilizing anesthetic. You can immediately get an effects profile of that drug right off the bat. You don't have to like write out its individual effects and what neurotransmitters it acts on, et cetera. You can immediately get an idea of what it does. And from there, you can immediately get an idea of what it interacts with. So if you, for instance, find someone who you know has taken a certain medication, let's say that they're taking an MAOI, which is a kind of antidepressant, and your friend is like, oh, okay, well, they took ecstasy, they took MDMA. Immediately, by knowing that MDMA is a stimulant, by knowing that it's a hallucinogen, you know that it has an effect on serotonin, which an MAOI also has an effect on. And from there, you can be like, oh, this person might be a risk for serotonin syndrome right now. So it's stuff like that that could genuinely save someone's life. If you have an understanding just basically of what these effects categories are, it can really reduce the amount of time that you have to take to understand how they function. So not on this chart are cannabinoids, which we'll get to later, um, which is the weed, and then opioids. And in this diagram, they're known as narcotic analgesics. And there's the word narcotic there, pain relief in a medical context, and inhalants. And inhalants are kind of a different animal altogether. We'll come back to what that means. That's not right. So um, in terms of how drugs are administered, the phrase root of administration is how they're administered, right? It's how you do them. And the, the acronym for this is ROA. Excuse me. So some of the ways that someone might administer a drug are insufflation. And this is not technically the correct term for this because to insufflate something means to have it blown into your cavity. Like someone puts a fucking hair dryer and a dollar bill of cocaine and just goes to town, which isn't very realistic at a rave because you can't find outlets. So insufflation is just kind of the, the layman's term that we've adopted for snorting drugs, right? And whoever this person is, if they're really snorting a line that big of whatever, they're going to have a really hard night, I think. Um, if it's ketamine, bye-bye. So this is also known as snorting or railing something, presumably because you could actually put it on a railing and just like go around it or sniffing. That's another term for it. Um, also the stock image, that's not what it looks like when someone injects, that's just a hot mess right there. Um, stock images and drugs, they just don't go well together. So intravenous injection is also known as shooting up or banging. Um, insufflate, or sorry, inhalation is known as huffing more often than not. Um, this is presumably some kind of gasoline, I would say, product in there. Um, transdermal, this is very uncommon. You know, it's, it's really not, you're not going to be like, oh, well, yes, I would like to have this cocaine patch absorbed through my skin. That's just not very frequent. Rachel, it's blurry again. No way. Um, people don't typically, oh, this is the problem with Zoom, people don't typically transderm, and there's no term for this because people don't really do it. You know, the worst that someone would, the worst, the most that someone might do is gum a So, for instance, you would dip your finger in a little bit of powder and you rub it on your gums because your blood vessels are right below your gums and it would absorb through them. Um, there is a lot of controversy over whether or not things like LSD or acid can be absorbed through your skin. The short answer is it cannot. And what, and I know, I, hold your horses. I know there are a billion anecdotes coming my way right now, but what you need to remember about that is that your mucous membranes in your eyes, your nose, your mouth are typically what will, or whatever else, are typically what will absorb any drug that you put near them. So if you spill a couple drops of acid on your skin and you rub them off and you wash your hands, but you miss a little bit and you wipe your face, there's acid in your eyeballs. And yeah, you can totally drop acid in your eyeballs and it's not as crazy as it sounds. Oral administration, probably the most common, right? It's just eating or popping. People make fun of me when I say the phrase eating mushrooms, but I think it makes sense. They're mushrooms. It makes sense. Suppository, this thing goes up your butthole. Um, this is known as boofing or plugging. And um, was it Kavanaugh that got a lot of flack for this because he talked about boofing with the boys and the entire harm reduction community was like, oh, he just admitted to putting drugs up his ass. But I don't think that actually was what he was referring to. Then there's smoking, which is also known as dragging or toking, or if you're using a vape, it could be sipping. And then subligal administration is under the tongue. Again, you can even see those bad boys right there, those blood vessels very immediately under the surface of your tongue. So a lot of people will hold their acid tabs under their tongue for a longer period of time before swallowing them. Now, again, just to get this quick and dirty out of the way, and believe me, this is the absolute tip of this iceberg, and this is a very reductive thing that I'm about to say, but generally speaking, because these are two words that are conflated all the time and used improperly all the time, Generally speaking, addiction is considered to be a mishmash of all kinds of things. Now, it's considered to be an, uh, a mishmash of social implications, of biological implications, environmental, genetic, bio did I mention biological? <laughs> yes. Um, and the disease model of addiction states that 
addiction is a chronic disease of the reward systems in the brain. And while it's true that we do see that there are a lot of brain changes in terms of structure and in terms of responsiveness and sensitivity in people that use drugs or people that have like some kind of addictive pull towards a particular drug or action, um, it's, it's minimalist, right? Like that doesn't explain everything that's going on. So that's something that we're working right now to kind of tease apart because more often than not, again, you'll see a headline that's like, man dies from addictive drug overdose and it totally removes all the social implications behind that. There was a study released a couple of years ago that showed that rats that were put in a rat heaven cage where there were all kinds of things to interact with and other rats around and some of the water bottles had cocaine in them like oh who did that right like <laughs> crazy and some of them did not that the rats would always or more often go for the water without cocaine in it because they had so much external stimulation but rats that were kept in isolation in cages would go for the water with the cocaine in it. So it's just one example of many that kind of builds towards this prospect of the concept of addiction being one, rooted in isolation, but two, also having neurological consequences. So that's just tip of iceberg, just wanna get that out of the way. The difference between addiction and dependence is that it, dependence means that your body will not function normally without the substance present. So you go through withdrawals, and or experience tolerance. You need more of a substance to get the effect desired. And we'll come back to this, I'm not trying to open this today, but just wanna get that basic thing out of the way of that it's not that simple. Okay, in order from left to right, usually if I were in a classroom setting, I would have you guys guess what each of these are, um, but we can't do that because the world is online. So on the left, we have presumably MDMA slash Molly slash ecstasy. They all mean the same thing, but refer in some more slang terms to different forms of MDMA. Adderall in the middle, also known as Addy or speed, depending on where you're at. Um, this is primary component is called dextroamphetamine or amphetamine as it's known more locally on the streets. And that is a major stimulant in Europe, but also in the US as well. Um, this is presumably cocaine, but most cocaine does not actually contain mostly cocaine. We'll come back to that though. And this is methamphetamine, also known as tweak or speed. Now, something that we'll come back to with all of this is that you might look at these and immediately be like, oh, I ID that one, and that one's that, and that one's that. But we'll play my favorite game next time, which is name that drug and see how well you can actually ID substances by looking at them. So in terms of the effects of stimulants, I wanna kind of go through each of the major categories of drugs right now and keep my eye on the time. Um, the effects of stimulants as a whole, or like when we're, when we're classifying stimulants and other categories as a whole, what we want to do is get a list of effects or properties of those particular drugs that are shared across multiple drugs. So if you say, for instance, like cocaine and methamphetamine are both stimulants, you immediately have a minor effects profile that is able to be generalized across multiple drugs, right? So this is very helpful. Again, in the situation of someone taking an MAY and MDMA, let's say that that person is also taking Adderall. So if you know that MDMA is, it's not a huge stimulant comparatively, but MDMA is a stimulant, and this person's also on Adderall, then you might be a little bit more concerned about their blood pressure and their heart rate, because you would know that stimulants both would raise blood pressure and heart rate. These are like life-saving things, right? Like, this is not to be discredited. These are life-saving things. So in the case of something like this ridiculous diagram from the internet, um, these highlighted yellow things are examples of things that might be shared across stimulants. So for instance, insomnia, inability to sleep while you are currently under the influence of a stimulant, and then thereafter hypersomnia, which is too much sleep or excessive sleepiness. Um, it's a pretty common thing across many different kinds of stimulants, as well as bruxism, which is um, jaw clenching and pruritus, which is itching. And we'll come back to that one. That one's a little bit less prominent than the other ones, but it's interesting nonetheless. But then if you look at all these other things on this diagram, all of these might be more specific to cocaine than say methamphetamine. So you have this kind of list of, generally speaking, these things can be expected from a stimulant. And then you have other lists of like, okay, in the case of cocaine specifically, there are things that might be more pertaining to cocaine. So for instance, nasal discharge might be more common from cocaine because of the way that it's administered, right? Um, and then also the way the drugs are broken down in the liver, like cocaine might be broken down differently than methamphetamine or amphetamine. So just something to keep in mind. Then there's this one, which is insatiable hunger. I'm actually not sure where that one comes from. I haven't encountered that one, but if anyone has, let me know. 
So stimulants as a whole, and also I'm really into symbols. It helped me stay sane while I was making this course. So if you see this symbol above or next to a drug or a neurotransmitter, you know that it's pertaining to stimulants specifically. So stimulants are basically everything is amped up, right? Your body is functioning as it would, but more on a very basic level. That's, that's obviously reductive but your heart rate will go up, your blood pressure will go up, your rate of respiration of breathing will go up, your energy levels go up, your alertness, your cognition might be improved or increased depending on the dose, but that is dose dependent for a lot of things. Something like amphetamine or Adderall at lower doses might improve your cognition, but if you take too much of it, you might have scattered cognition. There's kind of a bell curve of that. Um, many stimulants will induce mydriasis or pupil dilation. Maybe my favorite word in the entire world, aside from noodle or synecdoche, because I learned that word in Aquila and the Bee when I was nine years old. And then there's bruxism or jaw clenching. Um, and bruxism is very common, especially with drugs like MDMA, which is, again, like a stimulant, but also has other qualities too. It's not that stimulating comparatively. Um, but this is really common because oftentimes if you see someone that's taken Adderall and they're studying or whatever it is they're doing or they're playing Call of Duty and they're trying to find all the Easter eggs of Black Ops zombies and they've been up for 19 days and you're watching them talk to you and you see them kind of like chewing a little bit, that's a good indicator that they might be on a stimulant. But you never know for sure. But it's a nice first indicator if you see someone whose jaw looks very tense and they're chewing a little bit. It's a bit subtle, but if you start looking for it, you might notice it. And then there's skin picking and itching or pruritus. Now this we're not really gonna get into right now because this is a more nuanced effect of some kinds of drugs, particularly opioids and stimulants. Um, this is more commonly going to occur at higher doses or more chronically administered doses of certain opioids and stimulants, but it can often lead to just like intense itchiness. This is a very common side effect of chronic high dose use of methamphetamine. So let's play guess that schedule right now. Is this gonna work with 40 people in a Zoom? I have no idea, but let's try it. So let's look at cocaine, right? So coke comes in the form of powder or it can come in the form of crystal, which in some cases is crack cocaine. Does anyone know the difference between crack and cocaine? Anyone? Bueller. Oh, look at all of you. Just free base. Is salt? Is it baking soda or something? Yeah, it's baking soda. It's just baking soda. That's it. Crack cocaine is coke with baking soda. Does anyone know the schedule of cocaine? Like, remember, let's remember what the schedules are, right? Schedule one drugs have high potential for abuse and no currently accepted medical value. Schedule two is high potential for abuse and some accepted medical value. Knowing that cocaine and crack are the same exact thing, but crack is typically smoked. You can smoke cocaine also, it's just not as effective. The reason that crack is called crack is because it makes a snap, crackle, pop sound when you put it in a pipe and smoke it, when you heat it up, that's the sound that it makes. Um, but does anyone have any guesses as to what the schedules are for cocaine and crack cocaine? It's just yelling out. Coke. Coke is schedule one, crack is schedule two. Opposite, I think. I was going to yeah, say Yeah. Coke is Schedule 2 mm. and crack is Schedule 1. But does anyone know why that might be the case? Can because, anyone think of uh, uh, They use cocaine, cocaine for like – they use cocaine for like um, – in like lab experiments, right? To like test um, – to test animal behavior and stuff? Mm -hmm. That was heroin. It's a low-income discrimination thing because more African-Americans that are low-income would be arrested for crack than the white rich people for cocaine. But that's just my experience. Yep. And there were a lot of good suggestions there. Can you see me sweating more and more as this time goes on? Man, I feel so shiny right now. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Ohio. It's, it's drunk. The state is drunk, I swear to God. It was like snowing a, a bit ago and now it's like 98 billion degrees out so we're going to come way back to that one because that's a whole big can of worms but the main reason and it's true that cocaine is used in laboratory studies but many many drugs are used in laboratory studies in fact most drugs are used in laboratory studies at some point and in some way um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they have medical application right but the main reason is because of racism <laughs> that's true that's absolutely correct um, and we're gonna, like I said, go way, way into that later because there's a whole lot to unpack with that one um, involving the CIA and other similarly angelic organizations. 
caffeine, unscheduled, right? But I just want to kind of put this out there because I love symbols and drop shadows, and you're going to see a lot of both of those things. Like, when did drop shadows go out of style? I have no idea how that could have happened. They're the best thing that ever happened to, like, school projects. So cocaine can be smoked or snorted, but technically you can do a lot more things to get cocaine into your body. And something that I really want to drive home with Roots Administration here, I hope that these symbols are at least kind of obvious, Something I really want to drive home with this is that you can do pretty much any drug pretty much any way for the most part. And you might have more success doing it one way as opposed to another, right? Because it might be more bioavailable, more effective. But you can inject caffeine. <laughs> you can put caffeine up your asshole. Like you can do crazy shit with it. You can vaporize it, I'm sure. I I'm actually not sure about that one. Everything is fallible. Everything we know is fallible. Anyway. That is so just really dangerous. Yeah, it sounds like it would be. And then we have MDMA, um, which is a Schedule One drug, also known as Molly, also known as Ecstasy, also has this adorable chemical structure that I love so much. Very cute. Um, and then there's amphetamines. And amphetamines can come in the form of crystal or powders or pills. And oftentimes, what happens is that you'll either get a rock, like a crystal rock of something that gets broken up, and then it becomes kind of powder over time, which is very easy to cut. So pro tip, if you are going to buy something on the black market, I'm sorry, we're phasing that phrase out. If we're going to buy something on the illicit market, um, it's a good idea to look for crystal or rocks as opposed to straight powder. Not because you're guaranteed to have a safer experience, but because oftentimes only the chemist can cut straight crystal if it's like a sizable crystal. So either the crystal is generally speaking what you're looking for or not. However, don't take that as a rule. Just take that as like, if you have to choose one or the other, I would recommend choosing crystal, just so you know. We can talk more about that if you'd like. Um, amphetamines are schedule two drugs, Adderall including is schedule two. And then there's something like nicotine, which is unscheduled. So interestingly, nicotine is actually a, is it stimulant at lower? Yeah, stimulant at lower doses and depressant at higher doses, interestingly enough. Now for depressants, I'm sure none of you have ever had a negative interaction with this ever in your entire life, specifically this flavor. Um, for loco is an example of alcohol, which you may or may not know is also called booze. <laughs> Here at Drug Sigur, we teach you the most cutting edge of vernacular. And then there's something like a benzodiazepine, also known as benzos, cleverly, or DXM, which might be known as robo. And these are all examples of classic depressants. So the category of a depressant is a little bit more restricted because in order for something to be a true depressant, it's largely going to have a calming effect on the system. And things such as opioids and cannabis, while they do have calming effects on the system, are also stimulating to other parts of the brain in, in notable ways. So they're not technically classified as 100% depressants. You can make the same argument for many of these things. Many drugs that have depressant qualities also do stimulate other areas of the brain, but for our intents and purposes, probably the most prominent depressants that we'll talk about are alcohol, benzos, and DXM. So opposite to stimulants, depressants lead to decreased everything across the board in terms of, I mean, like, you're not going to become dumber somehow, but, well, not necessarily, but you're going to have a depressed respiration rate, which is actually possibly the most dangerous part of depressants in terms of overdose is not enough oxygen because you're not breathing as much. And also your heart rate is lowered, so you're not circulating as much oxygen throughout your body. So depressants are going to lower your blood pressure and your heart rate. You're not going to be breathing quite as deeply or as frequently. Your attention span will be more limited. Your energy might be a little bit lowered. Your alertness might be a bit lowered. But depressants tend to make you feel quite relaxed. Obviously, alcohol is the best example of this. And we're not going to be talking about alcohol too much because there's a lot of information available on it already. Um, but depressants as a class have a high propensity for temporary amnesia. And this can become more chronic with, with memory loss if someone is ingesting particular depressants chronically over long periods of time. And this can extend itself to motor control, which is actually, there are ties between depressants and Parkinson's that we'll come back to later. Um, and also um, some stimulus as well. And then sedation, you know, this is like the classic image of sweet, sweet frat boys loving on each other on a Friday night. So alcohol, obviously the most popular depressant, unscheduled. You can vaporize alcohol and uh, drink it, e eat it, 
become one with it that way. And then there's DXM in the form of a liquid or a pill, and DXM is cough syrup, basically. And this is also unscheduled. You can get it um, over the counter. Like, it's Robitussin, you know? And you have to chug, like, a bottle of it, and it's definitely not good for your liver if you do that, but it is possible to get extremely high from DXM. And we'll come back to all of these things. The one thing that I do want to avoid right now, and I, I would be able to do this more effectively in person together, is have there ever be some kind of uh, a misunderstanding where me introducing a drug and then not elaborating on its risk profile immediately makes anyone be like, okay, I'm going to go try that one out. Please wait until research has been done and you've really, like, just because you're acquainted with it as a concept doesn't mean you should go, for instance, if I say, you can go to Home Depot and buy Hawaiian or morning glory seeds and eat them and get high. Like, don't do that yet, <laughs> please, <laughs> I beg you. Then there's GHB, which is this guy right here. And GHB can come in a liquid or powder form, and that's a schedule one substance that many people are actually not familiar with that are outside of nightlife scenes. And then there's benzos, which most frequently come in a pill form. And those are schedule four drugs. I've had this question in here since the very beginning and no one's ever gotten it wrong, but the opposite of a depressant is not an antidepressant, but rather a stimulant. <laughs> is that too obvious? I'm actually not positive. But yeah, just, just in case you were wondering, it's, it's a stimulant, not an antidepressant. Now to the inhalant class. Um, some of you might be familiar with these already. Whippets are also known as nitrous oxide or NOS. And then you have poppers. Um, the rest of these are just other examples of things that can be inhaled. But poppers, I don't really have a lot of um, poppers in this course. Maybe I'll add them because they're becoming more prevalent again. Um, but dust off is another major one, as well as gasoline and paint and spray paint and nail polish remover and glue and whiteout. And many things that have some kind of an off-gassing odor can be used as inhalants. One small thing, so, actually. I learned that uh, whippets are actually also referred to as nangs recently. Oh, yes, yes. Um, I, I think that originated in New Zealand, right? I do not know, but it was a friend of mine who referred to them as Nangs, and I was like, oh, I've never heard that one before. Yeah, so yeah it's a New Zealand and Australian term for that. Yeah, yeah. I, I met a Kiwi on a train going to Portland who told me about how he threw bush doofs where they would have Nangs in the scampi, which meant that they would throw raves in his backyard and do whippets in his treehouse. House. So that's a phrase that you can use to impress your friends and family if you so choose. Oh, so quick note about inhalants. Common misconception is that weed is an inhalant. It's not. Um, inhalants are things that can be consumed without heating or burning them. There's no combustion involved in inhalants. Excuse me. So weed, obviously, you have to burn it for it to have an effect, and we'll come back to that. So there are many different things that can be inhaled, like gases and solvents. Aerosols have propellants in them, so they'll shoot out of the can. And then nitrites can be used as, um, or they have an, a relaxant effect. So things like solvents, you simply would put them in an enclosed space and inhale them. Aerosols are sprayed directly out, and nitrites, you know, it's kind of a mixture of multiple things. Um, the gases involved in inhalants are often medical, but shown propane. Not medical, I don't think. I've never heard of anyone getting a propane treatment. So the big thing that I want to note about inhalants as a class is that really the main thing we're looking at here is how they are consumed. Obviously they're called inhalants for a reason, right? Like they are inhaled, it makes sense. But they happen to share some effects across them. And perhaps the most predominant is the pain relief and the sedation aspect of these. Um, there's a reason that many of you have probably gotten high as fuck on nitrous when going under for surgery in the past. It's a very common anesthetic aid that's used. And then there's hypoxia, which can happen when you cut off um, blood flow to your extremities. And this happens when people do things like, for instance, put on a gas mask and hook up a, t a tank of NOS to it. That's a really easy way to die. Um, and also just like continuously have their face in some kind of a bag or something like that where there's an inhalant so that they don't get enough mixture of oxygen with their blood and that can cause blue tinting of the extremities. And this is actually a really easy indicator that someone is not breathing effectively. This is an indicator of an opioid overdose, this is an indicator of all kinds of things that say that someone has depressed respiration or is not getting enough oxygen to their, their extremities. So that can happen in their lips, their fingers, their toes, etc. And then in the case of nitrous, um, if you discharge chargers, and we'll come back to exactly how that happens, I'll show you a very cute video of how that how that's done. Um, if you discharge nitrous from a charger directly onto your face, you will get frostbite. It really is very painful. Um, if you're going to be using nitrous chargers, please don't try and use them without the correct equipment. 
because the pressurized nitrous oxide gas inside of these chargers, when released, is extremely cold. So if people are doing nitrous incorrectly, it's pretty difficult to do this um, if you have anything that's even remotely supposed to help you crack a nitrous charger, but this is a risk because of how cold the gas is. So all of these things are unscheduled. And there's a specific demographic where inhalants are very popular because they're unscheduled. There are two specific demographics. The first is low income, particularly, um, particularly in India and some regions of Africa. Um, children are very susceptible to inhalants right now. Inhalants are causing very serious problems with kids because especially street children, again something we'll come back to later, um, have easy access to drugs like um, glue and whiteout and spray paint, etc. So that's something that we're currently looking into as a global issue. Um, in terms of all of these, the best tolerated of them is by far and away nitrous oxide. It's used in medicine. It's a safe and essential medicine by the World Health Organization. Um, these other things we'll come back to a little bit in more detail. Did I not talk about the thing? Oh, yeah. I'm going to run out of time. So, again, many of these might look a little bit familiar to you. That left one probably would be the most obvious one is LSD or acid. And then mushrooms, the primary component of mushrooms is the primary thing that gets too high in mushrooms is psilocybin. And psilocybin is a molecule that's broken down in your body into psilocin. Anyone have any idea what this might be? Salvia. Salvia. Yeah, that's salvia. Nice. It's salvia divinorum. This is a, a dried plant matter. This is actually sold in a lot of head shops and smoke shops in some regions. Um, we'll come back to that. And then this one says so on it, so I can't even ask you, but it's 2CB, and we'll come back to 2CB as well. And anyone know what these are and what's contained in them? Is that peyote? That's peyote. What's the primary active chemical in peyote? Anyone know? Mescaline? Mescaline, right on. Okay, so peyote, which contains a drug called mescaline, and this is mescaline in powder form. And there's actually a huge historical controversy about having powdered mescaline because peyote buttons used predominantly by um, indigenous populations in northern Mexico were consistently subjugated by the government and shamed and degraded and this was used as an act of cultural terrorism of basically being like your animals for eating these cacti and getting high. But at the same time, labs in the US and Europe were extracting mescaline into powder form to use in experiments with great success and being very self-congratulatory and drinking their whiskey and singing the Titanic and whatever else white people do. So that's a mescaline thing that we'll come back to because the history of peyote and mescaline containing plants is very indicative of how drugs have been historically used to subjugate marginalized demographics based on what they do if you can't subjugate them based on who they are. We'll see that over and over and over and over again. And then this one, any ideas on this one? It's kind of a yellowish powder. Pro tip, it smells like burning plastic. What is it? Thoughts, prayers? DMT. Yes. That's DMT. Yeah, that's DMT. I couldn't hear what someone just said, but I bet it was a great guess. <laughs> it wasn't right. So DMT, also known as Dimitri or the businessman's trip, and it's known as the businessman's trip because in the 70s or late 60s when it was popularized, it was known that um, corporate men would step outside on their, on their smoke breaks to go blast off on DMT, come back inside, rip off their suits, and quit their jobs. So it was known as the businessman's trip. Now, one quick thing about nomenclature with hallucinogens, because this drives me absolutely crazy. A lot of people will say, oh, this drug is a hallucinogenic. Hallucinogenic is referring to a property of a drug. If a drug is hallucinogenic, it, it's an adjective. It describes what it does. If a drug is a hallucinogen, that's describing the category that it's in. That's really nitpicky of me, honestly. But I just want to put it out there. There's descriptions to all these slides if you want to read more about what I'm saying with this. But the umbrella term of hallucinogen consists of smaller designations, things that have hallucinogenic properties. So for instance, classical psychedelics are known as being perception altering drugs and psychedelics also include within them the smaller subcategories of dissociatives and delirients. And you can probably kind of pick up on what those mean. We'll, we'll go into both of those in, in great depth. 
but dissociatives produce states of dissociation, right? And delirians produce states of confusion and delirium. So the word hallucinogen is the biggest, broadest category for these things. And within that, you might have classical psychedelics, which is referring to a specific subset of psychedelics that people know best. So for instance, LSD and psilocybin mushrooms and DMT, 2CB now as well, those are classical psychedelics. And then kind of more on the fringe might be dissociatives and delirians. But we'll come back to all these. I know this is a lot of information also, um, but I promise this, this is just a big, broad introduction. And then for the effects of hallucinogens, again, my dryasis, my favorite word ever, aside from noodle and synecdoche, is a common side effect of, of psychedelics, right? It's pupil dilation, often to the point where there's very little actual iris visible. Um, there's much more prominent pupil dilation on, on hallucinogens than there is on stimulants, even though they both do dilate pupils. And one of the main things that you get from hallucinogens is perceptual changes. And a huge misconception about hallucinogens is that all they are are seeing things, right? Like they're called hallucinogens, it makes sense. But the main thing about a psychedelic experience under the influence of hallucinogen is the way that the way that you process information changes. And this isn't just sensory information, it's also the way that you consider how things relate to each other and how different things interact on a more broad and interconnected scale. And also the fact that how do I use this toothbrush? It's very long and why would I put it inside of my mouth? So these can all be things that happen in the influence of psychedelics. We'll go way in depth. That's my favorite one to talk about. I'm so excited for it. And then there's mental health impact of these that is also very complex that we'll go into great detail with later. But it's possible to either have um, alleviation of mental health symptoms or exacerbation of mental health symptoms depending on the context in which you do these drugs. Context is everything with drugs. Everything. Last thing I'll go over, um, and then we'll save the rest for next time. Popular hallucinogens include LSD, otherwise known as acid, um, which can come in liquid form. It can be blotter, gel tabs. It can be on candies. Usually you drop it on in form of liquid. Schedule one drug. Psilocybin is mushrooms, and you can grind them up into powder. But if someone tells you that they have mushroom powder, it's probably, and they're like, oh no, it's like synthesized in a lab. It's probably a different drug that we'll talk about sometime in the future called 4 ACO DMT. Um, psilocybin is also a schedule one drug. DMT, also a schedule one drug, comes in crystal form and you smoke it. Very difficult. And then mescaline is also you would have guessed it's schedule one drug. Anyone know what salvia is though? Any guesses yeah, on what? On, it. On, on what schedule it is. Oh. Unscheduled? It's unscheduled. It's unscheduled. Yeah. So that's the last we're going to talk about today because I've got a hot date with the 2003 video game. Thank you guys so much for dropping into the first drug go. I'm so glad to be able to teach this course. Um, so excited. We'll be back tomorrow. 3 p.m. Eastern and Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern, and those will be the same lectures. So I'll finish up this one and go on to the next one. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to let me know. 